right, cool. I think we're good to go. All right, so welcome to today's webinar. This is on 3D printing a gearbox. My name is Robert French. I'm an applications engineer here at GoEngineer. Uh, you can see my email right here on the screen, rfrench at goengineer.com. If you guys have any questions, follow-up questions, or more in-depth questions that you know, I'm, I'm happy to field any questions you guys have today, be sure to type them into the questions box. Uh, if I can answer them while we're going, I will. If it's something I'll take to the end, we'll, we'll take care of that. But uh, don't be shy. Ask some questions. And uh, my email's there if you guys have anything more in-depth. Cool. So let's get started. Ooh, let me get back over to my... There we go. Cool. So 3D printing a gearbox. So there's a, a couple of bullet points that we were going to try to hit today. A couple of criteria about you know what this presentation is going to cover. First one being design for print. So... Uh, 3D printers give us a lot of flexibility, a lot of cool stuff we can do with them, but still some best practices, some some considerations, ways we can, you know, be smart about this. We don't want to just throw everything at the printer blindly. Let's make some educated decisions and, and get the most out of our printer. Uh, the printer settings, once again, kind of going into that, getting the most out of our printer. Uh, we have a lot of great printers here at Go Engineer. We, we uh, are a reseller for Stratasys, so we have the Polyjet and the FDM technology. Uh, but within those, there's still a lot more uh, refinement that can be done, ways we can really get the most out of our prints. And then lastly, uh, kind of uh, builds into a lot of disciplines, including 3D printing, is top-down modeling. So uh, integrating purchase, purchase components will be kind of the big focus here on top-down modeling. Uh, we, we, we know what we want to achieve. We know some purchase parts right off the bat that we're going to need to achieve this. How do we incorporate those into our de design? How do we build our design around those? Cool. So where are we starting from? Uh, what is this gearbox? Why do we want this gearbox? You know, where's the story start? So last year, actually, for right around Halloween time, I did some content on 3D printing. Uh, just did a write-up paper. It's on our website. If anybody wants a link to it, to it or the actual model, I'd be happy to give it to them. But I basically designed this Halloween carousel from last year. So you can see the CAD model there on the left. Uh, kind of did a wrap command using sketch pictures. Pulling, out, I'm not, I'm not that great of an artist, but uh, pulled some pictures off the internet. Able to trace around them using auto trace programs or just drawing splines manually. Some spider webs, Frankenstein's, haunted houses. You can see the uh, 3D printed part in progress there in the middle, and then the finalized 3D printed part there at the end. I uh, actually have this in the office. It, it looks great. It was a really fun part to print. So the idea is this is kind of one of those child's light up toys. Uh, at night, you put the light in the middle. It kind of shows shadows on the wall. Uh, and so you kind of want, we wanted that to turn, you know, it could be stationary, but we wanted one to kind of turn, right? Give the illusion of Frankenstein, Frankenstein uh, walking past or what have you. So uh, trying to make something that'll, you know, make this uh, this this carousel turn. So we have a couple purchase components that we want to throw into this design. Uh, first, we have this little uh, gear motor, and uh, uh, this is one of the big driving components of our design. A lot of our design will be based around this, and this just happened to be a motor. We're lucky enough down here in uh, the San Diego office where I'm out of that. Me and my boss, who's an electrical engineer, happened to go to Fry's one day and said, hey, what if we got a motor to turn this thing, to make this thing revolve and give it a little life? Uh, so we, we picked up that little uh, uh, DC gear motor over at Fry's. And then we also bought uh, some bushings. So these bushings I got right off of McMaster car, uh, little Teflon bushings. And they, uh, they were the only really other critical component because... The 3D printed materials are great. You can make some great functional parts, but the amount of rotation and, and just kind of rotational force and rotational gears and spinning inside of things, the material doesn't do too good about rubbing against itself in terms of mitigating friction. So that's why we bought these uh, Teflon bearings as well. All right, a couple more uh, purchase components, but uh, you can kind of see there, I say not exactly purchase parts, right? Because we are going to be end up using a purchase part here. I mean, gears are, you know, pretty well established. They have a lot of standards about them, and I didn't want to, you know, reinvent the wheel per se. So, found a lot of great gears on McMaster car, plastic gears, 14 and a half uh, inch pressure angle, pretty standard uh, type of gear. Uh, and the reason I say not exactly purchase, because, you know, these are purchasable components, obviously, but I need to adapt them a little bit to my design, and I'm really just interested in the geometry. And so 
McMaster Car is one of those great websites, lots of other ones out there, but McMaster Car, uh, a really good example of just very, very open about sharing their CAD data. Uh, you click on any one of these products, product detail right here, takes you to the page where you can download in a, a, lots of different formats. So uh, uh, we're, we're kind of using this purchase part, but we're going to 3D print it. So I'm capturing the geometry. So that's why I kind of say not really a purchase part. I'm, I'm just going to capture this model, modify it, and end up 3D printing these gears myself. All right. So top-down modeling in, soft, soft, uh, in SolidWorks. So we're going to jump into the software right now. So let me pull up SolidWorks for us real quick. All right, so here's uh, one of the uh, gears straight off of the McMaster Car website. So a lot of cool stuff in here. Uh, great SolidWorks model. One of the more important things that the model does provide us with is this pitch diameter. So anybody that's dealt in gearing or uh, belts, pulleys, uh, things like that, understand how important this pitch diameter is. This is kind of the... Uh, point of uh, contact between the different gears. This is the real, you know, uh, uh, the acting diameter, if you will. So the ratio of gears to gears is kind of set by this guy. All right, so a lot of uh, extra features on here that I don't necessarily need for my gearbox. You know, I got this gigantic hub on here. I know I'm not going to be transmitting a lot of force, so I'm not interested in that. Uh, I really just want this, this tooth profile. And the whole reason for this gearbox is this little gear motor is rated for very high RPM. I need to kind of, you know, mitigate that or I need to, you know, turn that down, get a lower RPM. Well, you know, as I go lower RPM, I also gain great torque. So uh, this little tiny motor will be more than enough as long as I can reduce the speed. That'll give me the advantage in torque. I'll be able to turn my uh, somewhat large carousel. I don't know if I mentioned, but that carousel that we're creating this gearbox for that I mentioned earlier is roughly... Uh, six or eight inches in diameter, about six or eight inches tall. So a decent amount of mass that we have to move. So I need to get rid of this hub. I can do that with some simple cut extrude and boss extrude commands. I use the cut extrude to first uh, kind of get rid of this additional hub up here. I'm left with a little hole in the middle that isn't sized properly for me. So then I go ahead and uh, uh, use an extrude to fill that in. So all this would work with non-native uh, CAD formats. I could do all the same things I'm doing now as long as I have a solid body in SolidWorks. And actually in 2018, even with STLs and some non-native CAD formats, I have a lot of functionality, a lot of, uh, a lot of tools within the software to help me fix up models that I might not have a great feature tree for or a great definition of. Uh, and then a pitch diameter circle is something we could sketch manually if needed. It's published with every gear that's every sold. It's a very important uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, value uh, for gears, right? All right, so I do a little work there, clean up the gear to get it kind of to, you know, just this is the essentially the, the bare minimum of what I would need. And I'll start to add additional features for uh, my hub and, and, and linking up to other gears. So I did that by starting a sketch right here. It's a sketch of my new hub that I plan to create. And I don't want to really create it here. I'm kind of creating it blindly. Uh, so that's what we use top-down modeling for. I can start to put stuff all in an assembly, start to reference it to one another to kind of put some intelligence or, and parametric design behind my model. You know, as one part updates or changes, then I see my components linked to that that are kind of dependent or have this interdependency between each other also update. So a lot of uh, powerful uh, workflow there. So let's jump ahead to Gearbox in progress. So here's that same gear with uh, this sketch hub that I started on it. And I've also got my much smaller gear, gear. So this is a 12 tooth and a 96 tooth. So this is an eight to one uh, speed uh, reduction or an eight to one uh, power increase, right? They're inverse of each other. So what does this hub need to look like? What does this, this big gears hub need to look like? Well, I've already got the sketch going uh, for, you know, I, I understand the basic shape. It needs to fit inside of this bushing. This is the bushing I purchased off McMaster Car. We can see right there in the feature tree, I still have the number associated with it, the McMaster Car part number associated with it. So what I'm going to do here is mate this little bushing, mate this little bushing where I think it would about exist in my, uh, in my assembly. So I do a nice concentric mate there to the big gear. Obviously the concentric is a no brainer. And then 
I don't exactly want these faces rubbing entirely. I might do a little bit of spacing just to make sure, you know, we want to minimize the, the friction surfaces, if you will. So instead of a coincidence relationship there, I'm going to add a, you know, maybe a, a 30 second spacing. Cool. So now I've got those two components kind of established relative to one another, where they're going to live in my final assembly relative to one another. So now I can start to work on this gear in context. This is very much the heart of top-down modeling. So I'm going to edit this part. I'm not going to open up the part itself individually in its own window. I'm going to edit the part, this fourth option over in the quick context toolbar. You'll notice every other part turns gray. The part I'm working on turns blue. So I'm in part mode in essence right here in the assembly file, editing this large gear wheel. Well, we had this sketch in here for the hub that I had created initially. I mean, I could have created it here in the assembly as well, but just kind of got a head start earlier. So I edit that sketch. So we're editing that sketch for that hub right here in uh, the assembly. So I'm going to add some relations. I'm going to say this kind of hub line here is collinear. I'm going to inset this line. And like I said, I didn't want it full radius. I kind of want to minimize the rubbing. So let's get a nice normal two view here. Zoom to fit. And uh, I'm going to put this guy slightly inside. So I'm going to say keep it 60 thou inside. Ooh, maybe 60 thou is a little much. Let's go to the half that. So I can just type divide 2 in here. And then let's reverse the offset as well. Perfect. All right. So let's go orthogonal one more time. Let's turn on our wireframe. And now I can see this... Ooh, still in dimension mode. Now I can see this inner line here, this inner edge or inner cylindrical surface of the uh, bushing. I'll take my hub OD and that bushing ID, make them collinear. And I won't worry about the length for right now, but essentially I've got that sketch, relative, you know, it's parametrically tied to the position of the other components in the assembly. I can jump into my features tree now, do a revolved base, Jumping out of editing the part. And now I've got that hub created based on other components, right? So if I were to update that bushing file and perhaps grow it in size, shrink it in size, move its mate relationship inside this assembly, I'll see these hub features of my new gear update. So that's top-down modeling in a nutshell. Obvious advantages to it. I'm not changing multiple parts. Uh, if I have three or four parts that are all kind of independent but work together in an assembly, then anytime I make a design change, I can really add up a lot of work for myself. Whereas if one component is kind of driving the size or shape of a lot of components, if I intelligently link them, I give myself kind of a one-stop shop. Now I can go to that one component, update it, and see all my features update respectively. So throw that hub back on, looking good. All right, so uh, just kind of setting up a couple more conditions for you know where these different components are going to end up, how they're going to uh, behave in my assembly. Uh, let's talk about the interaction between these different gears. So I'll take this. Uh, yeah, great question, Mike Norman. Wouldn't you want clearance? So 100%, uh, uh, when I did collinear commands there, I could have just as easily also just done offset distances and things like that. Um, uh, I don't want to get into super specifics, but Mike, you're 100% correct, adding clearances and things like that. Totally doable. I don't have to use the collinear relationships. Uh, I'm not just locked down to only relationships between different components. I can add dimensions between different components. Now let's jump into that real quick. That's actually not a bad thing to look at. So, uh, I mean, you could see that, for example, right here on this guy, I happen to add the collinear relationship. I could delete that and add a dimension between that edge of the hub and the edge of the uh, uh, bushing there. So, yeah, totally, totally would want to add clearance. In this case, we didn't. We actually just kind of did it by eye, sand, sanded it down or, or just uh, polished it down a little bit if it didn't fit inside the bushing exactly right. But uh, all of that's possible. All right, so setting up uh, positions of a couple more components. Uh, we have these two different gears that need to line up uh, kind of face to face. So I'll grab those two guys, make them coincident. 
We also have some uh, principal planes inside of each of these parts that I'm going to use to line up here in a sec. We got the top plane running through the middle of that gear. We also have the top plane running through this gear. So I'll make those two guys together. And now the only thing that we're missing on is the uh, distance between these two gears, what, what type of a uh, tooth engagement we're going to want. So each of these files came with a pitch diameter sketch. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I just activate both of those so that we can see them out on, here on the screen. Now we can make these two guys together as well. Ooh, let's go uh, tangent. Perfect. So now we got the exact thread engagement that's recommended for these parts. And I didn't have to purchase them, right? That's the idea. These are somewhat purchased parts, right? They're uh, kind of off the shelf in a sense, but I can modify them slightly and simple enough geometry, pretty small that I, you know, even though those aren't really requirements, uh, I could 3D print these uh, very easily now with my own kind of custom modifications on them. Cool. So I, I kind of stem from there and I don't want to, you know, everything's just kind of a repeat or, or I'm just essentially doing the same steps over and over again. So I'm just going to kind of jump ahead uh, to kind of a uh, intermediate uh, position of the uh, design. Uh, so let's see right here. Excuse me. Final gearbox. So this is me uh, just kind of extending, uh, extending out those same principles. So uh, made a quick model of my motor. It was a simple enough motor. I just kind of measured the outer extents of it, uh, modeled up the electrical tangs very simply, just kind of an envelope picture just to make sure it, it'll fit. And, and I'm not, you know, uh, just making sure it'll fit inside my design. Simple as that. So I start to build up geometry about around it. I mean, I was using offset entities. So for instance, right here, like you said, Mike, I, I did add clearance here. I don't need a perfect press fit here but I uh, used an offset of the geometry to capture these tangs to uh, keep this motor from rotating itself as it powers up. So we can see uh, me inserting bushings everywhere I needed it, building some bracketry up. This is another great example, uh, this wheel, of what our printers can do with multi-materials that I'll speak to in a sec. But essentially got everything in place, uh, bracketry and whatnot, to... Uh, you know, get my gearbox going, everything parametrically designed. All right, so a few things that we're missing, uh, and I look at my time here, I don't have a time to get to all of it, but we have another bracket that we would want to build over here in context of this assembly to kind of hold up this, this cantilever arm. The one I'll go through real quick, and probably won't have enough time to, but we'll do it quickly, is uh, while we're in an assembly, we can actually do insert component, which I'm sure most of you have done. But rather than in inserting an existing component, let's insert a new part. We'll choose our template. So what it's asking for right here is us to choose a plane to start our first sketch on. I'm going to choose this bottom face down here. Let's go normal too. And I would start to draw my base plate. So just kind of draw an envelope look. And then we need kind of reliefs for these tangs, for these different feet where they can come down. So I would go through, choose all the feet. And in this case, I could do convert entities. That would be a zero, zero clearance fit, which might not work. Uh, but then, you know, that's not our only option. We can click additional feet. And instead of using convert entities this time, I'll use offset entities. We'll do an offset of maybe like two or three thou. Ooh. If I grab the individual edges rather than the face. Oh, sorry, guys. Oh, almost. All right, there we go. Now we can do off offset entities of 2000, giving ourselves a little bit of clearance. So we can take that face or that shape, excuse me, extrude it out, giving ourselves a base plate. I know I didn't grab all the holes, but a little short on time here. Right, so now we have these kind of this base plate for these little tangs of these different feet to plug into, whether we wanted clearance or press fit or what have you. So that actually becomes a new part right here in my assembly. Right, now we can kind of go look at the top level assembly and see, you know, exactly where we're at. So I got, ooh, looks like I missed short on my envelope. Sorry, I kind of rushed that. I didn't mean to gloss over it, but we're, I want to try to keep this, uh, don't want to waste your guys' time, stay within the time limit. Obviously convert all the other different pegs, make sure I capture all of them. Uh, and there we are with our 
uh, kind of final design with the idea of this uh, gearbox. This, this motor is rated for uh, 10,000 RPM, these little guys. So we have a 8 to 1, 8 to 1, 8 to 1 reduction, making 512 uh, total reduction. Uh, I get lots of torque out of this tiny little mower to t turn this big uh, assembly. Uh, so just want to cover the uh, benefits of the 3D printers here real quick. So um, the kind of the whole idea with this this uh, gearbox was proving to ourselves that we could do something a little bit more special than you know 3D printers do a lot of great stuff. Uh, if anybody you know I don't think I need to explain that to anyone here, but Happy to uh, answer any questions anyone has. And we also down here in the San Diego office, I don't know where anyone, where everyone's at on this webinar, but uh, all of our office, we, we attempt to have a lot of the 3D print technology in there. We welcome our customers in to discuss it. We got a really great 3D print lab down here in San Diego. So, you know, 3D printers, obviously a lot of ap applications, lots of cool stuff, but a lot of times it's like fixtures for machines or supplementing other processes. Well, this is kind of that same idea, but we're trying to take a step further and, and make these like fully functional and automate, uh, automation driving parts that can really do, do some mechanical functionality, some dynamic functionality. So um, two different technologies uh, for printing. We have the Stratasys uh, Polyjet, Polyjet print technology. This is the liquid printing. So uh, great for small and high resolution parts. Uh, great for complex geometry. Um, and the mixed materials is another huge benefit of the Stratasys Polyjet. So we have all different types of colors uh, that you can mix together. We have a red, a blue, and a yellow. Well, that's essentially your whole uh, uh, palette or your color scheme right there. We can mix together those colors in different amounts to achieve different colors. Um, that's a great one. Uh, uh, not criticizing it at all, but I love the function part of the mixed materials as well on the Polyjet. So since we're studying, starting with these liquid materials, uh, we can uh, achieve some really cool uh, uh, physical properties. We have really hard materials like our digital ABS, and we have really uh, flexible materials like our Tango or now Agilis. So the Agilis uh, is flexible, the digital ABS is hard. Since they both start as liquid, we can actually mix together some of the hard and some of the soft in different amounts, different ratios to achieve different durometers. Uh, and I'll show you how I use that in my uh, assembly here in a sec. Then we also have the FDM print technology. So this is starting with that wire spool um, uh, inside of a heated build chamber, never liquid, always somewhat solid print material. Uh, so this results in stronger parts. It's more true to the actual physical properties of plastics. I mean, in some cases, it literally is plastics. Um, and some of the great new materials like uh, nylon infused and carbon infused, really strong materials. Uh, and then you can also achieve a lot bigger parts. The, the build trays are typically a lot bigger. Um, uh, on the Fortis, you've got three by two by three. So you can print some some really honking parts uh, uh, for, your, uh, for whatever reason. All right, so... Um, I just wanted to talk about those briefly and what I used and where I used it inside of my uh, uh, gearbox here. So most of this stuff I did on uh, Polyjet. It, it could have been done on FDM, and I'll show you some of the uh, uh, considerations to be had there. Um, when we talk about optimizing for print also, there's no reason I couldn't combine all these bodies into one giant solid body and print them all as one giant solid body except for the assembly. I, I just wouldn't be able to assemble this thing. But uh, that's what's great about SolidWorks. At any time, I could take all these parts into a part file, use our combined command, say, no, these aren't two separate solid bodies. They're one continuous body. So uh, SolidWorks is really good for, for changing up some of those designs and, and feeding straight into the 3D print software to you know, either make assembly easier or uh, you know, whatever your goal might be, the, the printers and the solid, SolidWorks technology probably have a way of achieving that. Uh, so one place I did want to mention, like I said, is the mixed materials. So we're, we're, we're spinning our motor up, spinning all these gears, and we eventually need to make contact with our big turnabout up here, our big carousel up here. So the interaction between those two, if it was hard material, you know, hard stiff material to hard stiff material the, the chances of the friction and the and the you know gripping of one object onto the other would be 
pretty minimal and technically would be a line contact between this spin wheel and the underside of our carousel. So what we actually did is print this wheel with a ABS hub, digital ABS hub. We call it digital ABS because it's not true ABS. It's the digital ABS uh, simulated by the PolyJet printer has mechanical properties identical to ABS. And then we printed this as a mixture of the Tango and digital ABS. We gave it a little bit of a softy, gummy, rubbery feel. And if you actually look closely, we designed, you can see we designed the position of these components shows a decent amount of interference. That being that this wheel would deflect slightly, give a nice uh, flat surface area contact uh, to this hub and be able to spin it. Um, and so that was a great use of the uh, multi, uh, uh, multi-material, multi-function uh, uh, materials of the PolyJet. Um, oh, and actually, before I forget, I don't want to leave you guys without this, but... Uh, Sorry, I mean, don't mean to drag this over on you, but I did want to show you that I actually took a video of the gearbox, and I wanted to show you that now. So we can see our nice rubber wheel right here turning. We actually took apart a flashlight, a little mag light, uh, stole that button out of it, measured it up real quick, used the thread command within SolidWorks, made a nice little case for uh, holding all the electronics. Um... All right, so real quickly, let's also look at some optimization on our printer. So within this part, I actually did uh, some sketches to illustrate the way the 3D print technology works. So uh, we print in layers on pretty much every 3D printer. On the PolyJet printer, we're very much printing in these kind of sheet layers. And each one of these lines, or maybe the space between the lines rather, represents a different layer of print material being thrown down. Obviously, we print in much higher resolution than this. This is a two-inch gear, and I'm only showing 50 layers, where in reality, a two-inch part might have thousands of layers if it was printed in this vertical orientation. So the problem with this is in the middle, everything's fine, plenty of strength. When I get down into some of these teeth, you only have a, like some layers building up on each other, and there's a potential for break-off of these teeth. Same idea on these teeth that would be up at this perspective. Just not a lot of strength going through those teeth, not a lot of layers represented in those teeth. So that would be that orientation on PolyJet. We also have this orientation on PolyJet, which is what I actually printed in and provides a lot more strength to the part. Let me flip orthogonal here. Oops, sorry. Right, so now we have lots of layers inside of each teeth. Each teeth relative to the orientation of the layers is consistent. Uh, so we expect the same strength in every teeth. Um, whereas in the other orientation, some teeth might have failed, some teeth might have been okay. Uh, this one provides each teeth being very strong, being very consistent. Also minimizes our Z layers, right? Z being the vertical axis here. Minimizes our Z layers on our printer. Doesn't require nearly as much support material. Will print much faster. Um, so a lot of advantages there. And then lastly, I wanted to, uh, lastly for the print technologies, I wanted to jump into what does the FDM technology look like when it prints. All right, so the FDM, and I apologize for the somewhat rudimentary sketches here, but it gets the point across that the uh, FDM prints a lattice fill. So there's a lot of open space inside of the lattice fill in FDM print, which doesn't really sacrifice a lot of strength, obviously a little bit, but really minimizes the amount of material. You know, you're, you're taking away vast majority of the material while maintaining a vast majority of the strength. So it's a good trade-off there. But this lattice fill wouldn't do well out on the outer teeth. That's where the Insight software comes into handy. Um, it's the FDM software that allows you to refine that lattice fill. And you could choose certain areas on your part, such as these teeth, to refine that lattice and make sure you're getting uh, a nice plenty of uh, uh, material inside these teeth. I don't want a lot of open area. I want as, as strong as possible in there. So you could refine that with the Insight software. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, there's plenty more I could talk about. Um, here's another example of in context. The only other purchase part I have in here is this roller needle bearing from McMaster Car that I downloaded and put in here, designed a lot of stuff in context. Uh, here's a decision I made to, instead of printing this hub all as one piece, I decided to make this piece an individual component, 
because it would get rid of additional support material. I would just add it after the fact. Um, but a lot of different uh, ways we can optimize our design and, and really get the most out of our 3D printer. I believe that's all I had for you guys. Let me double check back to our PowerPoint. Cool. So yeah, we talked about the two different technologies. Once again, if anybody has questions, my email is rfrench at goengineer.com. Um, yeah, and that's all I have for you today. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm.